What do we do when our plans fall through? For some, maybe we sink into despair or fear. In 1944, Lieutenant Iro Onodo found himself stationed on an island in the Philippines as he was serving under the Japanese military. When reports started to get out that perhaps the war had ended, he was suspicious. And so he commanded his comrades to flee into the mountains and find hiding. And even months later, when the report came out and he found a note that said, come on out. The war ended on August 15th. Come down from the mountains. He still held out. In fact, he held out for years. Not believing all the pamphlets and flyers that were littering the island, the photographs, or even announcements over loudspeakers of people that might have recognized him, he still held out. And he didn't come out of his hiding for years and years later, living off of bananas and coconuts and cattle that he had stolen and slaughtered. Finally, it was 30 years later, in 1972, when Iro Onodo finally emerged from the corners of the jungle and came out of hiding. He wasn't alone. There were many other holdouts after World War II. There was a Taiwanese man who was serving in the Japanese military on an island in Indonesia, and he outlasted Iro Onodo by two years and didn't come out until a search party found him in 1974. Can you imagine that? How could anyone ever live in isolation and fear for so long? But isn't that what people do when they face fear and uncertainty? That's what we see as we look at the closing section of John's Gospel and we see how some of Jesus' disciples were locked down in fear. And this morning we see how even when our plans fall through. It's the good news of God that changes everything. The disciples certainly had their plans come crashing down. They did not expect Jesus to be arrested, beaten terribly, suffer a humiliating death. Jesus was dead and they knew that he was placed in the tomb. So there they were, it says, on the evening of the first day of the week. The disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. What's next, they were wondering. And then the disciples, it's not like they didn't have reports. When you look at Mary, who was the first that Jesus appeared to, Mary Magdalene, she held on to Jesus in amazement and she spoke to those disciples. But it says when they heard that she had seen the Lord, they did not believe her. And those other women who also went to the tomb and they saw Jesus and they met him on the way. We read in Luke's gospel account that he says, the woman came and reported this to the disciples, but they did not believe them because their words seemed like nonsense. Later that same day, Jesus appeared at some point to Peter. Did their hope perhaps grow then? Why were they behind locked doors? And two other disciples on the road to Emmaus also talked with, touched, ate food with Jesus. And they came and reported the good news. It's true, they said, the Lord is risen. But they were behind locked doors. Maybe you know how this is. When we are fearful of something, we're uncertain of something, our response is to lock ourselves in, shut the world out, and to hide and to try to play it safe. And the disciples here aren't alone in their fear that first Easter evening. There are many lies being circulated, just as there were at this time, that Jesus is not alive. The devil would have, rather have you believe that there is no resurrection. It's all just a big cover-up for those who are weak. Don't believe it. Flee to the hills and stay safe. This is the natural tendency of every human heart. That even though good news is proclaimed and shared, to doubt, to pull back. But Jesus would not have his disciples remain in doubt. 
It says, when the doors were locked, Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, peace be with you. And this was no ordinary greeting of peace. They knew this was the man who had told them, my peace I give you, and I don't give to you as the world gives. It's the peace which the world cannot give. Peace between God and sinners. The peace of forgiveness of sins, which he paid for them on the cross. Jesus then verified this peace. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced. When they not only heard of this peace, they saw the Lord. This is a peace which brought them joy so that they were overjoyed. Can you imagine that? It's not the type of joy that just tells someone the victory has been won and the battle's ended. No, this is the type of joy that you get when someone that you love comes back from battle alive and has conquered and the victory is complete and secure. Jesus is alive. The battle's ended. Forgiveness of sins has been proclaimed. They are at peace with God. But Jesus' appearing to his disciples was just the first step. They now were to be witnesses of that peace. Jesus said, Peace be with you. Just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. These same disciples who had been living in fear because they were not sure of what had taken place, who were uncertain, now had certainty. And their mission, their job was to proclaim, the battle's over, come on out, the victory is won, Jesus is alive, we are at peace with God. And yet we see that the first messenger, or the first one that they carry this message to, was a former disciple. There's this man, Thomas, one of the twelve, who was not with them. Thomas, it is often said, is labeled as a doubter. Maybe you've heard the expression, doubting Thomas. But that's not really the case. He was more than a doubter. Thomas said, Unless I see the nail marks and put my finger into the marks of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will never believe. Thomas was following the natural tendency the other disciples had, and continuing to follow it. It was not just doubt. For him, it was unbelief. Thomas, who once had seen and walked and lived and heard the words of the Lord and was a believer, was now fallen away from faith. He says, I will never believe. It's all a lie. It's a trap. Don't listen. It can't be true. Maybe you know someone like this. Maybe you yourself have experienced such struggles, doubts, disbelief. Someone who was once a believer, but they've listened to all the the word around them and the reports around them. They've listened to their own sinful heart and their own reasoning, and they've said, it's too good to be true. To the hills, flee, keep the doors locked. Later on that week, they're once again behind locked doors. Was it Thomas, perhaps, who insisted, guys, we're not out of the clear yet. We need to keep these doors locked. Maybe you know someone who has receded into the cave of their own heart. And maybe it's like Thomas. Maybe it's because their plans didn't go the way they thought they should. Maybe they faced some horrible experience like a loss or a death of someone they love. Maybe some other plan in their life fell through. And because of it, they've lost their faith and everything else they've given up on. How does God respond? Same way that he did with the other disciples. He had given them the reports, the eyewitnesses. Remember the woman? That's what Thomas had. Only he had more trusted people and friends telling him, the Lord is alive, we are at peace. For an entire week, Thomas had the same thing that every one of us has. The word of the eyewitnesses, that the battle's over, the victory's won, and Jesus is alive. Peace and forgiveness of sins. This is what God used. And in the end, God would not allow Thomas to remain in unbelief and doubt. Thomas was going to be, in fact, ironically, one of the strongest proclaimers of the resurrection. After eight days, his disciples were again inside. 
Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. And then Thomas's confession and proclamation, which ironically makes him from one of the biggest doubters of the resurrection to one of the strongest proponents and witnesses to the resurrected Christ. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. When Thomas saw Jesus alive, he knew the victory is won and that his God had become his salvation and that Jesus, the Son of God, was his living Lord and his God. Jesus says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. In other words, Thomas, here's my plan. You, these disciples, all these witnesses, they are going to tell others this message of the victory being won. And they're going to proclaim to others the forgiveness of sins and peace in my name. And they will be blessed even without seeing me. It's the power of the word of God that takes the human heart which is locked down in fear and it opens the door and it removes all fear. And like the disciples had, it brings joy and the peace of forgiveness. And that message which God intends to be proclaimed is like the messages that were scattered on the islands in the Philippines and all around, proclaiming the war is over, forgiveness is won. And now, God has you. Even you who might have doubted or lived in disbelief, you who struggle with fear, he has you as his witness as well. You who have heard this message and are blessed by believing this truth. Jesus is alive. Our plans don't always get carried out. Sometimes they'll fall through. And certainly that can lead us into fear. And certainly it can cause a lot of people to question and wonder what is true. But this much we know. We have the witness and we have the word. Jesus is alive. The battle has been won. It ended on Good Friday. And the proclamation of that victory started to be spread that first Easter Sunday. And it's still spread by you. And people are still blessed and brought from darkness and fear to joy and the gift of life and forgiveness and peace. Jesus is alive. He is risen. The battle's won. Peace be with you.